think we're at the point where I can begin. Uh, there are a couple of seats up, one seat or one, two, three seats up here if you want. I'm going to talk to you about spy radios and uh, spy radios and uh, the Enigma and uh, some CIA bugs. We'll start out with spy radios. Why do you need a spy radio? Well, when your country is being invaded up here at the top, the citizens sort of split up into three groups. On the right, we see the collaborators who join the enemy and work against uh, the population, the do-nothings in the middle. The guys we're concerned with are called the resistance. They are the patriots. They are the ones who are going to risk their lives in order to try to protect the country and the uh, civilization that they are happy with. In order to do that, they have to do a number of things. First of all, they have to gather information about the enemy. And they also have to receive news about the, how well the war is going on, which means they have to have receivers that tune in on, for instance, the British Broadcasting Company and other uh, sources of news so that they can tell what is happening during the war uh, in order to uh, receive news. And, and they also need to be able to send information to the BBC and to the Allies in order to help them to win the war. Now, very few of the resistance are trained radio operators, so we have to have parachute drops and we have to have British trained clandestine spy radio operators parachuted in to operate the spy radios inside the country that has been overrun. So it's quite a process, and I'm going to talk about that now. First of all, a gathering information. Tiny cameras were used during World War II, and they were put in the most unusual places. Here's one inside a woman's pocketbook, and she's just looking in her pocketbook. How could she possibly be a spy? And here's a guy who's just lighting a cigarette, but the cigarette lighter happens to have a camera inside it, a little viewing port, he's looking down in, composing his picture, and taking the picture through the front of the cigarette lighter. Uh, clandestine radio receivers that allowed the resistance to tell what was going on during the war were absolutely forbidden by the Germans, and if you were caught with one, you were instantly killed. So it was very important not to be caught with a clandestine radio receiver, and so great length was taken to hide them. Here's a radio receiver that was built inside a normal, uh, innocent-looking suitcase. Here is a telephone book, which has a radio inside it, a electric iron, which has a radio inside it, a furniture leg, which has a radio inside it, and a, um, a telephone, well, here we are, phonographs, a phonograph with a radio inside it uh, over here, phonograph with a radio inside it, um, the um, ability to build relatively small radios into things led to some very innovative techniques such as building one into a telephone. Now remember all these radio sets had to have some form of electric power, either the mains power or battery power, and so that had to be considered in terms of miniaturization, but usually the set itself could be miniaturized. Here's one that was built inside a thermos bottle, looks fairly normal here, and there's the radio removed. Inside a Brownie camera is a radio, you can see the tubes over there. And uh, here's one of the more unusual uh, receivers built into a, uh, a plate, and it's a crystal receiver and capable of receiving the BBC broadcast. Um, it, people were very, very ingenious in the things they used. Now this is an interesting one. This is a clock into which has been built a specialized receiver. And this receiver is a very amazing receiver. It's called the Sweetheart Radio. And it was invented in Britain and it was distributed in very large numbers to the resistance. The Sweetheart radio had a little battery pack over here, it had tuning dials up here, and it had an earphone, uh, that, a little very small earphone that went into each ear. So you could use it without having a great big monstrous thing to receive 
they broadcast from the British Broadcasting Company and any others that are broadcasting. If you want to come in and sort of go along the back wall, you're welcome to. I think we're out of this. Uh, one, more, one more seat up front if somebody is having trouble standing up, come on up front. Um, this is a group of, uh, of uh, resistance operators using the Sweetheart Radio. There it is there. And they were produced in very large numbers, as I said, um, but um, they are now very, very rare. They're bringing as much as $1,000 on eBay because of their great historic importance. They were the, right here in the corner, uh, they were the radios of, uh, of choice for the resistance. The uh, Germans also, surprisingly, supplied their people with radios. And they called their radios the Volksentheimer, sort of like a Volkswagen, the people's car, the people's radio, literally the people's radio. And they gave these radios out so that you could listen to the Hear the Fuhrer, Hear the Fuhrer on your Volksentheimer. The uh, Volksentheimer, however, also came with a red tag, dinky, uh, which says very clearly that the penalty for using your Volksempfänger to listen to anyone other than the Fuhrer is death. So how, how they could uh, enforce it, I don't know, but I'll tell you about some of the stories. Um, you were only supposed to tune this radio to the German propaganda radio, and if you were caught listening to an English language channel, you would be killed. And uh, the, one of the ways that the Germans had of determining whether people were, quote, abusing their Volksempfängers was that they would occasionally uh, put a tone, a loud tone, across the entire radio spectrum, uh, or, or across the, the frequencies that were used by the BBC, and they would have people walking around and listening, and if someone heard this tone, they would know that that radio was tuned to the BBC. They'd go in and kill the people who had the radio. Um, so it was, uh, it was a big, a very important thing. The other problem, if you remember my chart at the beginning, there are some people in the community who will turn in their neighbors. And literally, if you heard your neighbor set going beep, it meant that they were listening to the BBC. And if you were on that side, if you were on the collaborator side, you would turn them in and they would get killed and you would get some kind of a reward. So it's a scary way of life that is very hard for us to imagine, but um, definitely was going on at that point. Um, again, we have to have clandestine spy radio operators, and they were nicknamed pianists because they were using the Morse code and it sort of looked like they were playing the piano. Um, their wonderful book uh, on clandestine radio operators, uh, written by a ham and uh, full of wonderful pictures. Uh, this is a picture of the training process in England for people who were to become radio operators in occupied France. And they would be subjected to uh, Morse code training and also um, a, a lot of uh, learning about how to behave in Germany when they were parachuted into Germany with their radios. Uh, the British maintained a very elaborate wardrobe filled with German uniforms and various kinds so they could parachute people in and have them dressed just like Germans, not looking like the French resistance. And uh, so they would show people how to wear the clothing correctly and make sure that they weren't taking anything that might give them away as being uh, part of the English in invading uh, radio operators. Um, the uh, radio sets themselves were packed in, very carefully packed in um, shockproof containers. And this is a, a suitcase radio, transmit, receive radio. And you could see them being packed up here. And they were then put in this incredible uh, big thing full of airbags. And when it was dropped by parachute, it would hit the ground, and hopefully the radio would still be functional after it hit the ground. Uh, here are some radio operators uh, climbing into an airplane, uh, preceding uh, a radio drop into enemy territory. 
and uh, a number of pictures have been taken of these clandestine radio operators um, in action in the field and uh, for, for many of them setting up a radio in the field worked well because they could quickly pick it up, throw it up, throw the antenna up in a tree, pick up and run like hell because they knew they were going to be uh, zeroed in on by the enemy direction finding teams. Uh, these are some pictures of typical radio operators operating their sets in, um, in France. Uh, another picture, and we'll talk about these radios in a minute. Typically they were hidden in suitcases because suitcases were big enough to hold a radio and yet innocent enough to look like they weren't a radio. Um, here is an extraordinary woman, Phyllis Doyle, whose code name was Paulette and she was parachuted into Normandy before the invasion of Normandy at the age of 23. And she would send out half-hour coded reports and then run like hell as far away from where she was transmitting as possible, knowing that she would be found by the German direction-finding teams if she stayed there for any considerable length of time. Here's a picture of her in operation with her suitcase radio over here and uh, operating a telegraph key, of course. That's uh, Paulette. Um, the radios, unfortunately, were very, very, very heavy. So you have the suitcase, and normally suitcases have clothes in them, but, but the radio weighs for maybe 40 pounds or so. And so it's rather hard for a woman to carry a suitcase that's that heavy um, without looking as though it's a little bit odd because it's sort of sagging down. And so sometimes they would hang it under their arm, put it under their arm to make it a little less obvious what they were doing. But here's a woman carrying a B-2 radio set. That's one of the designators for the, um, the British uh, suitcase radios up a flight of stairs. A little bit easier if you happen to have a bicycle. And here's a man with a B-2 radio strapped to the back of his bicycle. Looks like just a normal piece of, uh, of luggage. And uh, he's trying to look innocent, but right on the back of the bicycle is his uh, B-2 radio. And the reason they had to transport them, of course, is again, they had to move around a lot. You couldn't just use the same location because the uh, British were always trying to locate where you were transmitting from. Here's another team. Usually they would have a spotter uh, watching for the possible approach of any enemy. The operators over here and an antenna being thrown up into a tree to uh, um, make the transmission possible. Uh, clandestine radio sets came in many varieties, but we'll go through a number of them here. Uh, they are beautifully described in a wonderful book by Louis Mulesty uh, called Wireless for the Warrior. And he has a number of volumes. They're pretty expensive, but they're really worth it if you're into this stuff at all. They list every imaginable kind of radio set. And this is volume four, which shows the clandestine radios that were most commonly used by the British and the French and the Italians and uh, the Germans and so on. A uh, wonderful book as a reference if you're interested in spy radios. This is the British spy radio Type A Mark II. Again, it has a uh, receiver, a transmitter, and a power supply. Just three major components inside the suitcase. Um, here is one that is designed for being dropped from a parachute. So instead of being inside a suitcase, it is inside a metal case, which tends to protect it somewhat from the, uh, from the problem of being uh, impacted when it hits the ground. Those of you in the, in the doorway, if you want to come in a little further, you can, there's room in the back there. Um, this is the famous British spy radio Type 3 Mark II. It's nicknamed the B-2. And this is a radio that you see most frequently. You'll see them on eBay. They're, they're fairly expensive, uh, running maybe uh, anywhere from five to $10,000 nowadays. 
uh, very beautifully designed radio. <clears throat> it was designed by a ham, G3ER, uh, John Brown, and he designed the circuit and the uh, layout of the, of the B2 radio, and it's a very fine radio. The uh, thing on the right over here is a power supply, and the power supply has to be capable of running this darn thing on a whole variety of different voltages that range from 220 to 110 to 24 to 12 to 6 volts. So that power supply had to be capable of quite a number of different voltages. The uh, receiver is down here, that's the main tuning knob, and there's the main tuning dial and uh, up here is the transmitter. Transmitter uses plug-in coils. So if you're going to change bands that you're operating on, you plug in a different coil. uses a crystal over here for frequency control and some spare coils uh, are kept in a little sort of a toolbox over on the left. Uh, headphones are used and the typical telegraph key that's used with a B2 radio is this one over here. They also used it in a lot of their field telegraph sets. It's one of the uh, many varieties of the WT8 uh, key. The circuit um, diagram for the B2 is very, very straightforward. Uh, you have a crystal over here, a crystal oscillator, an amplifier, and out to the antenna, and that's of course keyed, and uh, the key is in the circuit down in here. The receiver is also very, very straightforward. Numerous um, coils for the different bands over here. The, uh, it's a band switched receiver uh, and the receiver and the audio goes out uh, to the headphones over there. The power supply is perhaps the most interesting of these things. It consists of an immense and incredibly heavy transformer that you see here uh, with a vibrator to of course step up the voltage for the tubes and the problem is that that transformer is really heavy. I mean, if you get a chance to pick up a B2, you will know that that is a serious power transformer in there. So that reduced the flexibility of the radio somewhat to be that heavy, but it was still beautifully designed and very, very widely used throughout World War II. Um, let me run you through a few of the military radi radio designations. I'm sure you've heard of some of them. Uh, the SCR, and in World War II, the SCR refers to a set complete radio. So that would be a transmit, receive, and usually power supply. BC stands for a basic component. In late World War II, PRC radios came along and PRC stands for Portable Radio Communications. Then in the 1950s and on, they started adding other designations, TRC, which is Tactical Radio Communications, GRC, which is Ground Radio Communications, VRC, which is Vehicular Radio Communications, SINGAR, single channel, ground and airborne radio system, and on and on and on. They love playing with letters, and so you get all kinds of strange letters in front of these radios, but that's a useful little chart to be aware of when you're looking into surplus radios. Uh, let's look at a few of these. This is a uh, personal radio communication device, the PRC-1, built into a suitcase, of course, and very capable radio, capable of covering most of the VH, the um, uh, medium frequency bands from 2 to 30 megacycles or so. Pardon me if I use megacycles, we have to get into the right terminology here. None of this hurt stuff. Megacycles. <coughs> the uh, RS1 <coughs> was a GRC109 set. And this again could be fit into a suitcase. It had three parts, a power supply, uh, a transmitter, and a receiver. If you look right over here, you'll see the telegraph key for the transmitters located in there. Some calibration charts to allow you to tune it up for different frequencies and a couple of typical cr uh, crystals for selecting your transmitting frequency. Um, here is an RS6 set 
and this again has a number of different components a multi voltage power supply over here the receiver over here which is tunable that's the tuning dial no no this is the tuning dial for the receiver that's the receiver and the um, visible part there and the transmitter is over here it has a tiny little telegraph key that sticks out the back for uh, sending Morse code and it only was capable of Morse transmission and reception. Um, the Delco 5300, as we get more modern, uh, was one of the beautifully designed sets. Someone uh, came to me today and said, I have a beautiful Delco 5300, but I don't have the case for it. How do I find the case? And I imagine that's going to be pretty hard to do. But this is a beautifully designed little set. The telegraph key is located right there, so you can send directly from the set, or there's also a little plug here where you can plug in your telegraph key and your headphones. Um, and we move on to the problem of direction finding and locating these uh, transmitters. The Germans used uh, uh, various kinds of mobile devices and vehicles for locating the spy transmitters. This is a typical German van, and if you look up at the top here, you'll see a directional antenna up on top of the van and it doesn't look real conspicuous, but you know that the resistance was always on the watch for these things driving around. If they saw one, they would pick up and run as fast as they could uh, to get away from the location before they were spotted. Um, the uh, various kinds of direction-finding vehicles took various forms. Uh, we see a, a truck here, a, a, a sedan convertible, and this is inside Inside this vehicle, it looks like this, with a rotatable loop antenna for use in uh, trying to locate the spy transmitter. Um, here's a picture inside the um, van, and the operator is manually turning the loop, which is up on the roof up here somewhere, and listening for a no in the signal in order to try to locate the vector to the uh, set that they're looking for. If they only had one van, they would take a vector reading and then they would drive a quarter of a mile over somewhere else, take another reading, and look for the place where the two readings uh, coincided, where they crossed, the two bearings crossed, and that would give them the approximate location of the enemy radio transmitter. Um, here's another view inside the van, the operator again turning a um, an rotatable antenna here and listening for the signal. Um, the, there were also a number of hand-carried and portable devices. Once you had the, um, the spy transmitter located within maybe a block or two, or, or at least an area within the city, you get out on foot with some kind of a device and you start walking around and trying to zero in on exactly where the transmitter is. One of the techniques that they used for identifying what part of a city the transmitter was in was to actually kill the electric power to various parts of the city. Most of the uh, radio sets were run on mains power, on electric power, city power. And so if they stopped electric flow to different parts of the city, they could get a very broad idea of where the transmitter was transmitting from. And then they could go there and use vehicles to get closer and finally they would use a hand carried device such as this direction finding suitcase uh, to allow them to find the actual location of the transmitter. The uh, suitcase could be rotated just like a rotatable antenna, it had a loop antenna inside it. This is a typical World War II direction finding suitcase. There's a little control panel up on top for gain control and a set of earphones that were used to listen to the signal strength. And you would rotate the suitcase and uh, see where it was pointing and that would give you your vector to the radio transmitting station. 
Um, this guy is also carrying a direction finding device. However, he's trying to look very innocent about it. Now, you see a guy walking through your neighborhood looking like this. He's not looking very innocent, but in those days in World War II, that was sort of the way people dressed. And he would walk along the street uh, looking perfectly normal, occasionally looking at his wristwatch to see what time it was. And uh, every once in a while, he would take a bearing. And if we undress him, he's the flasher, we, we undress him, we see that around his waist is a radio receiver, and going down both of his arms is the loop antenna. And so he would simply rotate his body left or right and watch his wristwatch. The wristwatch happened to be uh, a signal strength meter. So he would watch his wristwatch and that would tell him whether he was pointing at the radio or not. He would rotate as he watched, watched his wristwatch to, oh yes, it's out of time. And he would get a pretty good bearing. So that was one of the techniques that they used in World War II to really get it close to the um, clandestine radio transmitter. Very hard to deal with. Um, the uh, next thing that they developed, the uh, uh, spy radio people and the people who were uh, transmitting messages had to think of some way so they couldn't be direction found. And of course the easiest way to do that is to shorten up your transmission really, really short, get it down to a second or less. And that could only be done by sending the messages in very, very short burst. And one of the early burst devices is this manual device, also good for radio operators who don't know the Morse code. You take this little stylus here and you run it very quickly down whatever letter you're trying to send. So over here you see the letter A, and if you run it down the letter A, there's a short little piece of metal in here and a long piece of metal, and by God, it sends out da for A. And so you could just go down sending these very quick transmissions, and that helped to reduce the likelihood that direction-finding devices would be able to zero in on these transmitters. Another device, there were many other devices, they were called typically burst encoders. And uh, there were various ways. This one, you would turn this dial uh, for each letter that you wanted to send, turn the dial to the letter, and then you crank a little handle on the end, push a little handle, and it uh, punches a hole in a 35 millimeter film tape. And you then take that tape and you put it into this device and you rotate this knob to wind up a spring and then you run that tape through this device and there are two contacts here which key the transmitter and in a second or two it will run through the entire tape sending your message at extreme speed into the radio transmitter and making it impossible for a person to get the loop antenna aimed in the right direction in that short a time. And uh, burst encoders have been improved dramatically. The Russians have some very fine ones that were used during the Cold War, sending a great deal of uh, information in such a short time. Uh, of course, we also have the possibility of enciphering messages, so the enemy can't tell what it is that we are sending. And there are a lot of different techniques for enciphering messages. Uh, the one-time pad is one of the favorite ones where you use a, a code sheet that you never reuse and the receiving station has the same code sheet and after that you destroy yours, they destroy theirs and they never reuse the uh, code sheets in one-time pads. The spies could not have Enigma machines, they're big, they're bulky, they just couldn't use them. So they had to use techniques, all kinds of techniques such as that to manually uh, encode and decode their messages. However, the spy, spy controllers, the officers who controlled the spies, 
had to communicate with each other about their spies and they had and used enigma machines and being of course totally unaware that enigma machines had been cracked by polish mathematicians six years before the beginning of the war and then the british received the information on how to crack those enigma messages and ran with it at bletchley park so the british were able to read all of the messages just about all of the messages that the german spy controllers were sending to each other and so although they're not intercepting the spies messages they were intercepting the controllers messages about the spies and that allowed them to know where the spies were what they were doing because they were the controllers were all talking to each other using the enigma code one thing i should mention about the enigma code is that the enigma machine encodes a message into a set of meaningless seemingly meaningless letters and those letters then have to be transmitted over to another enigma machine and decoded if that process involves a telephone line or a messenger then there's no way to intercept it uh, the only way you can intercept and decode enigma messages is if the messages are sent by radio and of course on the radio waves they were all sent in regular morse code they could be intercepted and using the polish techniques they were decoded and they could be read so it was it's important to realize that uh, the only enigma messages that could actually be uh, successfully intercepted had to be sent by radio as the war went on the allies specifically targeted telephone lines and railroad lines so the germans had no uh, alternative but to actually use radio to communicate between their main offices and that increased the number of enigma coded messages and made it so that the allies were able to decode those the enigmas were used by all branches of the german military and they were intercepted by the allies whenever they were um, transmitted on the radio waves um, here's a typical intercept station where british operators are intercepting enigma coded signals they would be then sent to Bletchley Park and uh, decoded. And uh, here's an interesting one. This guy is a ham radio operator uh, located in New York City, but he's also a spy. And uh, every, all of his neighbors thought he was just a, a friendly ham. You can see the Hallicrafters uh, loudspeaker here, and Hallicrafter and all, all the typical ham gear that we are used to. And for some reason, he had a picture of himself taken and he put it on his QSL card. <laughs> it's just amazing. And yet later it turned out that he was a spy for the Germans. He was trapped in his upper apartment in New York City. And here he is again um, by uh, direction finding techniques. And when he'd send transmissions that, that sounded a little unham like, he would be caught. Quite amazing. Uh, at the end of the war, all of the radios that had been confiscated by the Germans were returned to people. And here's a bunch of people taking their radios back. The Germans took away all non-Folksenfanger radios. And uh, at the end of the war, many people were able to get them back. Now let's move from that on to uh, bugs and uh, various ways of listening in on conversations. Um, it's a natural movement onward. The, uh, even the resistance had to use techniques such as this to determine uh, what was going on. They would try bugging uh, various kinds of uh, official offices in Germany and so on. And we'll just run through some of the technology and some of the history of um, bugs and uh, clandestine microphones. Of course, one of the most common of these was a microphone hidden in a wristwatch. A lot of the pictures, by the way, that I'm uh, showing come from CryptoMuseum.com. Dear friends of mine who research uh, spy radios very, very well. If you want to know anything about spy radios or enigmas or almost anything electronic and fun, you want to go to uh, CryptoMuseum.com. 
So a hidden microphone, uh, just a wristwatch with a microphone, and that would feed down into a tape recorder, and you could tape what was going on. This is an interesting little bug. This is a bug that was used by the uh, Stasi, by the uh, uh, Russians, during the Cold War. And uh, it looks like and is uh, named after a device, just a device that you put on the telephone line to sort of condition the line, but secretly. So, so an, a tele telephone repairman goes into your basement and says, pardon me, I have to put this thing in to, to make your telephone work better. He puts it in, and once he has it in, your telephone is now tapped. And it's tapped in a very simple way. You have two series capacitors here that allow the audio through, but do not allow the DC through. And it's a very simple unit, but very effective. And it was very widely used in, by the uh, Russians during the Cold War to tap into anybody's phone line that they thought were suspicious. Uh, how about a necktie? Well, I'll put my necktie on, and inside the necktie is my little radio transmitter and microphone and a little antenna that goes around my neck so that uh, the receiver can pick up whatever uh, is going on in the area around where I'm walking. Um, here is a CAT scan of a fairly recent CIA bug in a pen. You can see the batteries on the end out here, a microphone down on the other end, and a bunch of components with a couple of coils there, obviously just a, a fairly straightforward radio transmitter, transmitting the information coming in the microphone uh, by radio to a receiver that has to be fairly close by in order to receive the information. And uh, the bugs take many, many forms. It's just a, a hodgepodge of different bugs here. Again, this is from CryptoMuseum.com. If you want to look at what any of these specific bugs are, just go to that website, and every one of them is described in beautiful detail. These guys are really amazing. They, by the way, are the ones that uh, first uh, uh, drew a reversed engineering a drawing and a whole book on the Russian equivalent of the Enigma. Russians came up with something they called the Fialka, which was the equivalent of the Enigma, and they used that during the Cold War. Very beautiful and complex machine. Here's a KGB bug, and it's very, very simple and very straightforward. We see a microphone up here, a uh, little battery, and uh, we see that the microphone actually um, acts as a, a, a detuning uh, in the circuit to actually make it into a kind of an FM transmitter in which the frequency modulation is simply produced by the crystal earpiece which is used as a microphone in this circuit. Here's the circuit diagram and right here is the crystal earpiece and when it picks up sound it uh, diddles the, uh, the transistors here, changes the frequency, and that is all eventually transmitted out the antenna as a audio frequency modulated output which can be received and decoded. Um, bugs were not speci specifically uh, found in any particular area. In fact, the Russians specialized in putting bugs into places where um, you would never expect to find them. Here's a, an IBM electric, selectric typewriter, and in the very front, under the front platen there, where it's not even visible, is this multi-channel, um, multi multi-section um, radio transmitter capable of picking up all sounds in the room as well as the sounds of typing. And by analyzing the sounds of typing, you can actually get down so you can recognize what letters are being typed on the selectric typewriter just by doing a very tight frequency analysis of each of the letter sounds. So it was possible not only to hear what people were saying in the office, but to pick up what they were typing in the office. Um, the bug detectors, of course, uh, were developed about when bugs were developed. And uh, this whole process of, I, I've got a better bug, okay, I'll get a better detector. And the new bug detectors that were developed uh, took many forms. This is an interesting one. This is called the Tesla MRP4. And it was in use 
from 1972 through 2012, and it's thought that it's still being used. Um, it is capable of detecting radar, impulses, f of direction finding, and it's extremely, extremely simple. It was used by NATO in 2012 in Afghanistan and slightly modified as an MRP-4M later on. So this is a Cold War and later bug detector. And how does it work? Well, incredibly simple. It has two horn antennas, a big one and a small one. The big one feeds into an amplifier through diodes and into a detector and into a loudspeaker or set of earphones and a signal strength meter. The small one does the same thing. You just switch between them. You can switch, use this switch to switch between these antennas and the relative sensitivity. And on the small one, again, um, rectified by a diode fed into an amplifier, and it either drives a meter or a signal uh, or a loudspeaker. Now this device can be worn around fairly inconspicuously. Who would have think that this guy is wearing a bug detector, walking around in the field like that? Well, again, he's doing a flashing act, and oh, that's me, I guess, uh, wearing his Tesla MRP4. Uh, it doesn't even have to have the coat open in order to work it. So it's really a, quite a, an effective uh, bug finding device. And again, this device is used by walking around. You don't, you can't just use it uh, to locate the bug. You have to move around, and uh, the bug is typically straight. Uh, out from the front of the antennas. Here's another similar device, except it has a loop antenna. It's not quite so easy to conceal. And again, you walk around with this device and aim it in various directions. There's a signal strength meter that you can see there, and this guy is wearing a pair of earphones so he can listen in to the signal. Now, again, these are the techniques that were used during the Cold War to try and locate where microphones were hidden in rooms, in buildings, and so on. Um, it's also a technique that was used, it was jamming. And to jam a microphone, um, you put a very high intensity signal on into the room. So you, you want to make sure that nobody is able to um, to identify what's going on in the room, you jam the room by using a very high intensity signal. And uh, it is possible to still detect what the bug is picking up in that room by using a special kind of a detector. And it's, um, it uses a differential amplifier. So a bug detector of this type overcomes jamming. And for those of you who are not familiar with differential amplifiers, a differential amplifier does not um, amplify and indeed cancels out any signal that is picked up simultaneously by both antennas. A differential amplifier only amplifies any difference between this antenna and that antenna. And as you can see in a bug environment, even with jamming here, this antenna is going to be picking up a slightly stronger signal than this antenna over here. And that's what a differential bug detector amplifies and detects. So it's a way of overcoming jamming and still detecting the the information, extracting the, inf the information from the um, uh, environment. Uh, again, there are a tremendous number of bug detectors, and there's the MRP4 up there. Uh, again, this is a, an illustration from CryptoMuseum.com, and if you have any inter interest in this, you can just get a full education on these things. I'm just trying to summarize this uh, for your information. Um, the CIA also went into the bug business. Matter of fact, this in the uh, 1970s, they designed a very early form of a drone. And this is a battery-powered uh, flying bug that looks like a bug, but it actually has a microphone in its tail. And if you can imagine the CIA guys flying this thing around the room and having a wonderful time learning to fly their bug uh, in anticipation of the drone era that was coming 20 years after. 
so that worked fairly well but it was pretty obvious it made noise it did all kinds of things that were not ideal to insert into a hostile environment so then very recently they got the idea two thousand seventeen of actually using a dragonfly and this is a real honest to god living dragonfly with all of the transmitting equipment necessary to pick up, detect, and transmit information, audio information, as it flies through a room. And here's another view of it. You can see some of the circuits, little tiny antennas on there. And you can imagine this poor little dragonfly trying to flap its wings and fly around the environment with this thing on its back. It's just an amazing thought, but that's, that's our CIA in action folks and uh, magnificent idea I don't know how many of these they made or how many dragonflies got uh, sacrificed uh, but uh, it's a neat idea um, and again another picture of that okay now we start getting into some really interesting stuff it turns out that in 1945 the United the, uh, Russia donated a beautiful big wooden carved seal of the United States to the United States to put up in their embassy. And it was not until 1952, five, six, seven, seven years later, that they found out that the seal was bugging every single thing that was said in the room in the embassy where the seal was placed. And even more amazing, it was not until 1960, eight years later, that the CIA revealed that this seal was in there. So uh, how did this work? You know, you have to have a transmitter in order to have a bug, and they, the CIA routinely swept their rooms for transmitters. There couldn't be a transmitter in the room. So how could this device possibly be working? And the answer is that it was a very interesting device. If you look right here, it was a metal antenna and a little thing on the end there. And indeed, um, the thing, it was nicknamed the thing. And in the UN, the United States um, complained bitterly about how somebody bugged our embassy. And it must have been the USSR, so this is our ambassador to the United Nations complaining about the bug, which had been donated in 45, found in 52, and only revealed, that's what we're seeing here, in 1960, revealing the bug. Okay, now, Ronald Reagan actually suspended construction of the new embassy in Moscow when he heard about this, because they didn't want to have a lot of other bugs in there. How does the thing work, and what is the, te is the technology of this? And it turns out that it is an antenna, and it is coupled to a little plate here, and the, uh, there's a diaphragm up here, and uh, what happens is that the antenna is simply coupled to the diaphragm, and that wouldn't be very useful, except if you excite the antenna, and that's the trick, that's how the bug works. You transmit a signal at the bug, at the thing, and that excites the antenna, and the antenna then um, picks up the signal here, the signal modulates the excited antenna, and that's picked up on the receiver. So we see now a bug that has no power supply. Absolutely amazing. Look at this guy. Over here we see the transmitter. The transmitter is putting out a huge amount of power, 550 uh, effective radiated watts, uh, and exciting the antenna here. And the receiver is simply picking up through a high gain antenna the excited um, uh, signal from the antenna and amplifying it, feeding it into a tape recorder or a loudspeaker. The uh, uh, first generation worked like this. And the antenna itself had a diode in it, and the diode powered the amplifier. So you're exciting this antenna, you're causing it to, uh, to vibrate, essentially, and that is then uh, uh, rectified, fed into an amplifier, powers the amplifier, and the amplifier then is the radio transmitter, and the receiver is similarly powered uh, down here. 
Um, here is a better picture of the easy chair, the first generation. There's the antenna and the diodes in the middle over here. And we see here the diode, the antenna parts, a couple of uh, components. And uh, this was used successfully by our CIA in bugging the Russian embassy. The Russian embassy in 1958 um, was about using this technology. Um, the, uh, the, the machine was a little bit different. They bugged the, the leg of a uh, desk and they used a bug which was up in here that dropped into a hole in the leg in the desk. And again, it was irradiated. This is the actual bug, irradiated by a very high of, uh, power RF signal uh, and then radiated the signal and could be detected back out. 125 meters between the exciting area and the Russian embassy. So that's a, a long distance to transmit a signal that's going to power a bug and then receive the signal from the bug. And they had to use a very strong transmitter. They used actually 10,000 watts of transmission power by the time it got to the bug. And maybe you remember the, some problems that we've had recently in Cuba where some embassy people were having headaches. Probably something similar was going on there. They were being bombarded by huge, incredible amounts of power. In any event, this bug was hidden and uh, it was finally used quite effectively in the Soviet embassy. And finally, um, the, there were a number of problems with the bug as we've described it. Very high RF energy levels. They're easy to detect, obviously. 10, 10 kilowatts coming into your room would be pretty hard to uh, not be aware of. Headaches, uh, known about by the Russians. Countermeasures were developed and so on. And the next step uh, is to develop a device that used a pulse cavity rather than a DC and analog cavity. And the complications there are beyond what I have time to talk about. But the overall, uh, overall technology is the same. You transmit a high energy signal to a, an antenna, which is then coupled to a microphone, and the microphone then modulates the signal and it gets picked up here. But instead of using a regular RF signal, it's a pulse signal, and that's the difference. And that's uh, the story. I uh, hope you enjoyed that, and uh, I hope you'll come over and talk to me in the Swaps building. Uh, thanks for coming. I don't think I have time for questions, uh, but please feel free to come up and ask me anything you want.